All right, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your attendance. In Formula One, whenever a car leaves the pit and goes on the track, there are more than 300 sensors that capture more than a million data points per second. And all that data that is captured is used to optimize the performance of the car, the stability of the car, the reliability car. It's also used to optimize the wings, the, the, um, the distribution of the weight, and so on. If it's a race, that data is sent back to the engineering team while the car is driving. And the engineers are making changes to the car while the car is driving. Right? So they're making, trying to get the peak performance under all conditions while the car is driving. And those decisions are made by the engineering team, not by the driver. The driver in his seat, who could only react based on gut feelings, is not making those calls. It's the engineers that have all the data present. And in developer productivity engineering, we're in a similar situation. We need to capture build metrics that we can act upon. We need the data such that we can understand how is our tool chain behaving, and that we can improve the behavior of the tool chain. So we can make it more reliable, we can make it more stable, and we can make it more performant. We also need the data to improve bottlenecks in performance. Right? And once we understand where they are, we can apply acceleration technologies. And so we're in this constant cycle of capture data, interpret data, make changes, run the tool chain again, and again capture data, and so on. It's a never-ending um, cycle. <clears throat> if we look a bit more into accelerating the feedback cycle, which is what this is about today, we have several approaches how we can go about this. We can avoid work, conceptually speaking, by reusing work that has been done before. We can also wor avoid work by skipping work that is not related to the changes we made. And whenever we need to work, to do work, we can paralyze that work. And we can, of course, also make the work itself faster. Just give you one example each. If you use a calculator, it's not going to calculate pi every time you press the pi button. Right? It did it once, it stored it, and now it's always reused. If you have some linting rules, you make a change to a CSS file. We don't need to rerun the linting rules that are about Java. Right? If you have slow Scala compilation, well, you could distribute that compilation and get faster feedback cycles. And maybe Kotlin released a new compiler version that is faster. That is also a way to improve the speed of your um, tool chain. One example below, which is not super visible with the resolution of this screen, but basically, if we take something from the testing domain, if we have a test task that um, executes tests, um, and those tests haven't changed since the last run, the class path hasn't changed, and other inputs haven't changed, we can just reuse the test report, and we can skip the work totally. If we have a set of tests we need to run, Instead of running all the tests, we can only run those, or we can choose to run only those tests that are affected by the changes that were made. Right? And then we end up with just running a subset of tests. And whatever tests are left to run, we can distribute that work across multiple agents. So just to make that a bit more concrete. Now, if we look more into avoiding work by re reusing outputs that have been created by previous work, um, the question is, what is your unit of work? Right. Typically in Gradle or Maven, we use a task, and the artifacts are stored in a so-called build cache. But we could also choose a different type of unit of work. It could be, for example, the Gradle configuration phase, which as an artifact has the task graph, and we could store that in a so-called configuration cache. Right. But no matter what we choose as a unit of work, we have to persist it somewhere so we can reuse it on later builds. And ideally, it's that we have a local cache, but we also have a remote cache. So we can also share um, those artifacts between different developers or different CI agents, of course. Now, what typically doesn't work well is to base that unit of work um, or that scope of a unit of work um, from a commit ID right, or a branch name, because it's very coarse-grained. 
And the more coarse-grained it is, the more sensitive it is to cache invalidations. So what we experience, or I would say most people experience, including our customers and everybody else, um, if you turn on build caching, you get some savings, but typically you don't get the maximum of savings. Right? Sometimes people have the impression or the expectation, it's this magic bullet, I turn it on, and my build times are now fantastic from one moment to the next. Right? But oftentimes you get very significant savings already, but you can go further. Right? Um, but there's a little bit of investment in there, right? and we'll go into that in a, in, in a few minutes. So we need to invest a little bit to take our build that might already be somewhat cacheable to fully cacheable. And once it is fully cacheable, we want to keep it fully cacheable. Right? We don't want to regress. Um, so we need to keep investing to keep it there. But it pays off. Right? It's worth the investment. Right? Um, we'll have some numbers later on. To give you one concrete example, barely readable, but I will, I will, you will see the numbers up here. Right? Spring Boot, a very active open source project, but still modest in terms of number of builds per day. Right? There's 100 builds. There are customers, users, they have 20,000 builds a day. Right? But even those 100 builds add up. Right? So for every 24 hours that pass, Spring Boot is saving around 50, 55 hours in task execution day which equals to about six and a half full-time employees. So since you had lunch yesterday and today, 53 hours were saved in task execution time, which also means savings in CPU time, savings in, in CI infrastructure costs, and so on, besides developer time. Right. And now imagine you're doing 100, 1,000 times more builds. It explodes in terms of savings. So I said, when you turn on build caching, typically you experience some hits, but you don't get a, a hit on every task where you expect it to be there. And what are the reasons? There are multiple reasons, but I, I want to mention two of them. One is you might have, um, you want to consume an artifact from the cache, but it's not there anymore. It got evicted. Right? That is one. So it got put there, but by the time you want to use it, other things have already evicted it because they were put into the cache. Right? That's something you see, but it's, not, it's typically not the main reason. The main reason are volatile inputs. Right? Um, what are volatile inputs? It's, it's inputs that change between different executions of the build, but you don't really expect those changes to the inputs to, to have an impact on the output of that task or of that goal. Right? So for example, timestamps. You might have some timestamps as input. Every time you run the build, the timestamps is different. Right? So you will never get a cache hit on that goal or on that task. Or you might have some absolute path. Depending on where you run it, from a different location, you will get cache misses. Different operating systems. You checked out the project. You have different line endings. That might already cause some cache misses. Right? Or the, the, the build adds some user and host information. That, again, creates some volatile inputs in some of the tasks. Or very interestingly, and happening quite a lot, is when you use code generators, quite a few of those don't generate deterministic output. Right? Some of them create random method names. Other ones create random ordering of the methods. Right? And so whoever consumes that source code, and by who I mean the next task, who consumes that source code, will deal with volatile inputs. Version numbers, right? Maybe you bump up the version number on CI whenever you build because you use the pipeline or the job ID or something. You will have volatile inputs. <clears throat> so before we look at how we can tame those inputs, um, one thing to keep in mind is if you look at, at a task and, or a goal and you don't have a hit, um, oftentimes that task is not the culprit. The culprit is up, upward, upstream. right? So if you do some compilation based on source code that has been generated and you see you don't have hits for the compilation, it might be due that your code generator creates non-deterministic output. Right? So, so the root of the problem is not necessarily where you don't get the cache hit. It might also be upstream. Right? Um, and also very interesting with those volatile outputs in the, in, in the case of like the code generation where it would be an output, is that it can be masked if you use build caching. Right? Because if the inputs are the same, 
second time you run it, it will not generate that volatile output, but it will just take it from the cache, meaning the next task will also take this artifact as an input and because it's already cached, take the output from the cache, right? Um, but the moment you make a change, even if it doesn't affect the output, you will see cache invalidation across all these tasks. Right. Um, so really what we also should do, and it's something we want to do in the future, is task output tracking. Right. But even without that, just with task inputs tracking, we get quite far, as you will see. Okay. So how can we tame build cache misses? There is training available for Gradle and Maven. It's for free. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail, but conceptually, we can remove volatile inputs, and quite often it's possible. Like, you, why can't we just take things away from the build? Well, there are usually a lot of things in the build that shouldn't even or don't even need to be there, right? Every plugin adds a timestamp file, or many plugins do, right? And other things that, if you look at them more closely, well, I don't really need it. So why even have it there when it creates cache invalidation? Um, or you have volatile inputs and you make them stable. For development, it might not matter if the version number is always changing or it's fixed. Right, so you might change it to be fixed just for development. Or you can normalize them. If you say it doesn't matter what the absolute path is, you just care, care about the relative path, well then let's normalize the absolute path into a, a relative path. Now before we look at how we can go about finding build cache misses and fixing them, two things to keep in mind. Um, in my opinion, the process of optimizing the developer productivity should also be a productive process itself. Right? Um, and we'll, we'll see what that means in a second. And the second one is probably for most of you, there's more you could optimize than you have time and resources available. Right? So what do you optimize? Where do you invest your time, your resources? You need to make an informed decision. Right? And you need the data to do so. And that's something we, in developer productivity, um, that we always try to do is surface the data that allows you to make these, op these decisions. Um, so if we want to go and attain this fully cacheable build that you don't start with usually, um, we propose you run some experiments. Right? And those experiments, they should be measurable or they should be able to measure what happens while, what, while you run the experiment as well as what comes out of the experiment. They should happen in a controlled environment. So if I run the experiment while somebody else is building on, or CI is building, that should not affect my experiment. Right. It should be reproducible. So if I want to run the same experiment tomorrow, or I want to ask my colleague, please, can you investigate why you have, we have this build cache miss? He should be able to do exactly what I did and get the same results. And it should be automated. There's so many human errors you can do, especially when it's something that sounds very simple. I'll run the build twice, clear the cache, and so on errors all over the place. Right. So if we can automate that, um, that is part of running this experiment reliably. So to, to fulfill these requirements, we've created um, so-called build validation scripts, we call them. They're available for free. They belong, you could say, to Grail Enterprise, but they're not part of the core product. They're available on GitHub. Um, and in combination with build scans and the build comparison feature, um, we can efficiently detect what is taken from the cache, what is not, why is it not taken from the cache, address it, rerun the experiment um, with very little effort. Right? And that's what it should be. It should be very little effort, should be very productive uh, as, a, as, a, as an exercise. And there are three types of experiment. We can kind of mimic what the developer does. They build locally, they change branches, um, they build in the IDE, they build on the command line. Then we have the CI environment where we run on CI um, as part of a job, right? So we run, or as part of a pipeline, we run multiple jobs and we want to use the cache or we make a change and we make later a change again and then we want to leverage the cache between those two builds. Um, and the third scenario is we're building on CI, we're populating the cache and we're then building locally later as a developer and we want to benefit from whatever has been put into the cache, right? And for all these three scenarios, we, we have um, scripts available that allow you to verify very efficiently um, how cacheable is your build already. Um, so conceptually, before we see a demo, it starts by clearing the cache. Remote or locally doesn't really matter conceptually. <clears throat> we clear that cache. We run one build. It populates the cache with all the entries. 
And then we run the build again. Right? And that second build will try to consume from the cache. Get some hits, get some misses, get some more hits. And then when we're done, then it gets interesting. Right? But this is just mechanics. This is not where we want to spend time or we want to do something else while that happens. But then it gets interesting because now we can interpret the data. We can look at the build scans and other places and, and, and determine how well cacheable is built already. Where is it not? How much time does it cost us that it's not cacheable? Right? So we can really assess what do we want to do now? Do we want to fully optimize? Are we happy with how it is? That is then an informed decision that we can make. Okay, so we're gonna do a little demo here and show you how we can use these experiments to automate the process of running um, such an experiment and identify and then investigate those build cache misses so we can then quickly fix the root cause. All right, so for this demo, uh, we're going to run an experiment on one of Etienne's personal projects and we're gonna find out how cacheable his project is um, and if there's any uh, areas for improvement. So. Uh, first thing, we're going to run our, our build validation script, which will execute the experiment for us. Uh, what's it, it's gonna, what it's, it does is it checks out the project so you get a completely clean checkout, and then it will run those two builds that Etienne was talking about. So here we can see the two builds just ran. Now it's fetching the data from Gradle Enterprise, and now we can investigate. Uh, now that the experiment has ex executed, we can look at that data and we can try to understand the cacheability of the build. All right, so here we can see that 15 tasks in total, uh, three of those were executed uh, the second time, and of those three, one of them was cacheable. And so that's a task that we wish uh, had re did not run on the second build. Um, so we can dig into this. A little bit, we can look at the task uh, and kind of understand uh, which it was. So it was the test task. If we go back to the output from our experiment, we can uh, click on another link, which will load up a comparison of the inputs uh, for that task between the two different builds. So we can see here that there was something on the test task class path that changed. And when we look at it, it's a file that changed. Um, so that's interesting. I wonder what changed in that file between the two builds. So we can see why it was a mess. All right, so we'll go back. Uh, so one of the nice things about the build validation scripts is that it saves the state of the project for each of the builds. So that way we can say, what did that file look like at the end of build one? And what did that file look like at the end of build two? And we can just do a basic diff on them. So that's what I'm going to do here. We'll go into the data directory. You can see there are, there's a folder for the first build and the second build. And so we'll just do a diff across those two folders. And we can see here what changed is uh, a timestamp. So this file is one of those files that contains a timestamp in it. So if this was real life and we were, if, this was, if we felt it was really important to optimize this, we would use one of those strategies that Etienne introduced earlier to, to optimize this and uh, get that cacheable task so that it's always being pulled from the cache on the second build. So all the experiments we have run similarly to this one, including the ones on CI. Um, we can go further than that, though. We can even say we have a project that is not connected to Gradle Enterprise. It, kn it knows nothing about Gradle Enterprise. Um, but we still want to see what would we get out of the box? What would we, would we get if we invest a little bit more into, into the caching and get to a fully cacheable build? Right? We want to assess this with as little investment as possible. Right? Um, maybe your, pro your company already uses Gradle Enterprise. Some projects are connected, but you're working on a project that is not yet connected. But you still want to see, hmm, how much would I get out of it? So you have data, and you can go to your boss and say, hey, I also want to connect to it. Um, and so we're going to show you that as well, a little demo.
All right, for this one, uh, we thought it would be kind of fun to try uh, connecting the Apache Maven project to Gradle Enterprise, Maven itself. So uh, we're going to run the experiment, and we're going to connect it to Gradle Enterprise, and we'll, we'll see how it does. So just like before, we will run an experiment. So here you can see we're enabling Gradle Enterprise on it, and we're also pointing it to a particular Gradle Enterprise server to publish the build scans to. Next, once again, we do a clean checkout of the project. We run two builds, uh, which, because of demo magic, we can do almost instantly. Uh, and now we've got our out output. So again, let's take a look at the build scan for this. And we can see that uh, 509 goals uh, or or make up the project as a whole. Uh, 110 of those goals were avoided. Uh, and by the way, uh, this doesn't happen automatically. It bec because we connected the build to Gradle Enterprise, it enabled build caching on the build. Normally, the, the Maven build is not, does not have build caching on it at all, right? Um, but, and so just by doing that, we avoided 110 tasks on that second build. On the, on the, one of those uh, tasks, or one of the tasks we did not avoid because even though it was cacheable. So just like before, we could dig into this uh, and take a look and understand which of the goals was it that that missed, and then we could further optimize it if we wanted to. Thank you. And. Um, you know, maybe it's, it sounds funny that we use um, Apache Maven to, to connect and, and see how well cacheable it is, but we are um, in touch with Apache Software Foundation, and it's very likely that very soon all the Apache projects, whether it's Gradle or Maven, are going to be able, able and connect to Gradle Enterprise right? as part of an open source free offering. And then I think it's just a matter of time until um, Maven is probably built with uh, Gradle Enterprise as well. We can go yet one more step, right? And that is, well, maybe you don't even have Quail Enterprise installed in your company at all, right? But you still want to get some idea, of, hmm, what if I had it for Christmas, maybe? How many savings <laughs> would I get out of the box without investing? And if I invested a bit more, what would I get? Right? So we also have a mode for that that we want to quickly show you with a demo from Jim. All right, for this one, we will try uh, the experiment on Apache Beam. And this time, we're not going to connect it to a Gradle Enterprise server, but we are going to enable the Gradle Enterprise Gradle plugin, it's partly so that we can get uh, the caching to work, right? All right, so here we go again. We're going to run our experiment. This time, you can see we're disabling build scan publishing, so it won't actually connect to or it won't publish build scans to a Gradle Enterprise server. We do the checkout, and then we run our two builds, once again taking advantage of demo magic to do it very quickly. And we have our outcome here. So um, because build scan publishing was disabled, we don't have any of the links to a build scan, of course. But the, we were able to still gather some information from the build, and the build validation scripts show it to us here. So, just by enabling Gradle Enterprise on Apache Beam, we avoided on that second build two minutes of build time because uh, a lot of those tasks were taken from the cache. And we can also see that there was another about two seconds of um, another two seconds of build time that we could potentially optimize out if we did the same process that we've done, that we showed you before, where we, uh, we connect this to Gradle Enterprise, we publish a build scan, we can dig into that and understand why the task, cacheable task, was, was exe executed when we didn't want it to be. All right, so if you're interested, you want to know what could you get out of it, you have nothing to connect to, you can still get that data very cheaply 
very quickly and make an assessment, make a use case, and also determine is it worth it, right? We saw that there are two seconds left you could optimize. You can debate whether that is worth doing or not, right? Saving two seconds. But the two minutes and 53 seconds that you get out of the box, I think everybody would take them per build. Um, and there's also one area we didn't touch on at all, and we will not touch on this in presentation. But there are also these tasks that are not cacheable ever by default. Right? There, you might have written your own task. It will not be taken from the cache unless you do something with it. And we're not going there. Right? But you could also make those cacheables and, and transform something that would never be taken to something that is taken from the cache. OK, we can do a little bit of interesting extrapolation using that data that we captured. Right? So just looking at a single build, we're not, not looking at a stream of data. We're looking at a single build. Um, how much work can we avoid? It's basically the, the savings we realize from the beginning. That's what you saw the number, plus the potential of what else we could save. That is basically our total savings right, that we can get. But so far, it, this has all been sequential. We've just been adding up task execution times or goal execution times. Um, so we need to take, we need to normalize this to stay in this, um, uh, this, this type of wording um, with the parallelization. Right? And so if we normalize by parallelization, we, we get the number that is basically determining the maximum build time savings we would get for a single build, which is basically everything's taken from the cache. That's how much we can save, um, taking into account parallelization. Um, and then we can take a little bit of experience into account, so that's why it, is, it gets a bit more fuzzy. But what we see from experience is that if we have like a maximum build time saving of X, that the average build time savings you get over many builds are somewhere between 35 and 65 percent. It can of course be lower and higher, but on average, the average savings you get are somewhere in there. Right? So. Just having this single build, you can already kind of do the math. So I'm doing this many builds per day, per week. This is probably the amount of savings I get per week. Um, and how much is that worth? OK. So, so far, it, it has all been about making your build cacheable. But once you're there, you want to keep it cacheable. Right? You did all this investment. You don't want to regress. And we had customers. We helped them optimize the builds. They got the build times down significantly. And half a year later, they call us again and say, hey, we're back to where we were. Right. Why did this happen? It's not the fault of caching, but you add more people. You add more projects. You add more build logic. And all these things can lead to regression in your cacheability. It's like you have code and you make changes to your code. Um, well, you don't just test your code when you write it. You also test it um, over many many iterations. We heard from JetBrains yesterday, they still run tests from 20 years ago. Right. Um, so it's the same situation here um, in that we want to make sure we don't regress. Right. And so how can we do this? Um, first of all, we need some automation. Ideally, that runs on CI, unless you want to do this every time yourself when you go to work in the morning, to catch these regressions. You want to run that automation either based on some trigger, like a timing trigger, or based on some changes. And then when you run that automation, it should fail if your build is not fully cacheable anymore. So you instantly spot it. Just like you run tests, and then when they fail, you instantly know I, I broke something, unless it's a flaky test. So we can run experiments to do so and catch these regressions. We can also look at, comp at historic build data. Right? If we have a, a whole set of data and we don't even know where to start, we can also just look at historic build data and try to determine from that historic build data, hmm, should we have a ca had a cache miss, a uh, cache hit here, but we had a miss. And the third approach is we can also look at build cache related failures. I'll, I'll explain later why this is important. And then once we know, I mean, that's the key. We need to know fixing is usually easy. But the knowing is, is, the, is not the hard part, but it's the part where we need to do a little bit of investment. <clears throat> so we're going to give you a demo for the first case, which is we want to run something on CI that catches these regressions. All right. So here you can see we're in Team City, our CI system. And we've set up a couple of jobs to uh, make sure that the spring projects uh, uh, remain fully cacheable, fully optimized. 
Um, and so here you can see this job that's using to build validation scripts. That's how we've automated it. Um, we can see that for a while it was pretty good. It, uh, everything remained cacheable. And then just recently, uh, it stopped being cacheable. So we can dig in right here and see what's going on. If we go to the build log, and then we go all the way down to the bottom, we get to see something very familiar by now, the same uh, experiment summary that we saw when we were running the experiments directly from the command line. And so from here, we can click on one of these links and load up the build scan. And once again, we can go through the same process. We can see, we can take a look at which tasks uh, were avoided and which ones were not, and then start an investigation into why this regression uh, slipped in to the build. So it's basically we're using the experiments we already had. We're just running them, and we're making the experiment fail if something's not taken from the cache. So that's not part of the presentation. <laughs> There it is. I must have stepped on it. All right. So the second approach we can take is we can look at historic data. Right? So we have a ton of builds. We have multiple projects. So how do we know if something regressed? Right? And I think this can be done in different degrees of sophistication. One is. You take all the builds from the same project, you take the builds with the same commit ID, and you take non-dirty builds, so they don't have any local modifications. Whether it's a CI build or a local build, doesn't matter. Um, but if they're in that same state, you, you can expect to have build cache uh, hits. Right? There, are some DVA, there are some nuances to it, but it gives you, it gives you a list to, that is already quite a bit narrowed down, and you can go from there. Right? And then you can start comparing such builds that meet these criteria. And you can check, well, did my second build take everything from the cache, which was already put into the cache by the first build? Right. That, that's the idea here. And you could go even further. You could even, in my opinion, you could even apply something like machine learning and try to predict which cache misses were due to um, actually a volatility in an input. So we did this on the Spring project. Spring project is always a good project. Um, it's, it's, it's an open source project. It uses Gradle Enterprise openly, um, and um, they, they have a, they're in a good state. Right? And without, it, it shouldn't look overwhelming, but what we see is when we, when we did this run, we looked at these builds, we compared them. There was one that, that popped up, and it's the ASCII doctor. If we had followed um, through on, on what Jim showed before in this experiment that we ran on CI, the ASCII doctor one was the one showing up. So this way, the same task showed up again, right, with this approach. Right. And so once we know, oh, ASCII doctor should have taken, um, in this second build here, it should have taken things from the cache, but it didn't, then we know what to do. We need to fix that and investigate and fix that, that cache miss. Right. So, and this is an approach that would work even if you have 20,000 builds a day. Right. Just find those pairs where you expect cache hits. And then, um, and then investigate when you don't have the cache. Right. The third approach, and uh, they're not exclusive, ideally they're used in, in combination with each other, is, is around build cache failures. What we often see is people optimize the projects, they benefit from the cache highly, and then suddenly a month later, like, well, we don't get any, the build, have gone up, build times have gone up, we don't see any savings anymore, what's going on? Right. And then oftentimes it turns out Either there was a network issue, so suddenly the Steam City or the Jenkins server cannot reach um, the Gradle Enterprise anymore, so things are not stored in the cache anymore, or access keys have been uh, switched, but the, the CI has not been updated, and so on. So not really things related to caching itself, but 
but the, the whole setup, the infrastructure and build caching is not, no longer working, right? And this can easily be um, missed, right? So by going through all the builds and trying to find these build cache errors, which is very easy, right? we, this is all captured data and build scans, we can see, did we have any build remote cache errors? And we actually see in Spring Boot and Spring Security and Spring, they had some. I mean, it's very low, right? If you have a serious problem, this number would be much higher, especially when you have a lot of builds. But just as, a, as an example, I wanted to, to show that we can expose these errors and then we can do something about them, right? Or maybe, there could be a scenario where you have one cache entry that is really big. It's too big for what the cache accepts. And if that entry is put into the cache very early in the build, it will be refused by the cache node. And as a consequence, Gradle as well as Maven will turn off caching for the rest of that build. So anything else that happens in that build will not benefit from caching. It will also not push anything to the cache. So any later build will also not benefit from the cache. Right? So it can be pretty severe. And it can be hard to detect, unless you put up something like this. Right. Just a few um, final observations around um, build caching. You could see some negative avoidance savings, meaning it, meaning it takes longer to fetch it from the cache than to build it yourself, or build it on CI. Right. That can be the case in, when you have really slow network connections. Right. Maybe you're on a VPN, um, yeah, and it just takes too long, and then the benefit is not there anymore. But there are things you can do about this, besides improving the network. It can also be a situation where your cache entries on CI live longer in the local cache than in the remote cache, because in the remote cache they might get evicted faster. And as a consequence, you might end up with a situation where you run on CI, CI finds um, entries in the local cache, so it doesn't do anything with the remote cache, but then when somebody else, but then it gets re evicted from the remote cache. So if I then build locally and I try to get it from the remote cache, it's not there. But for CI, it's still in the local cache, right? So that's something to keep in mind. And one strategy is to just turn off local caching for CI and just rely on the remote cache. Um, and then a third thing we, we see around build caching is that sometimes these pipelines are set up that they fan out and they fan out very quickly. They fan out so quickly that they end up with jobs where the different jobs to do a lot of common work before they do the very specific work. Right. And one thing to tackle that is that you start introducing some seed jobs that happen before you start fanning out. Right. You do the common work and then when you get to the specific work, um, they can take that, that, that common work from the cache and then do the specific work. Right. So just a few things that maybe you want to take a look at in your setup. So to round this off, some of you surely have a lot of projects. I mean, I know some big companies have one project, but there are also those that have thousands of projects. Um, and so then the question becomes, well, where do I even start? Like, you cannot optimize your 10,000 projects. It doesn't even make sense. Right? They're not all worth optimizing. So where do you get the most return for your investment? Right? And uh, what does that mean? You first need some data. Right? So we can capture data, but you probably or maybe you're not in a situation to connect all Gradle Enterprise, all 10,000 projects to Gradle Enterprise first to get the data. Right? But how can you still get the data to make that decision where to invest? Right? Because once you have it, you can prioritize. Right? Um, and so what we offer for different um, CI servers is you can install plugins for different CI servers and they instrument your build with Gradle Enterprise and capture data and send it as build scans to Gradle Enterprise without modifying the project, right? So from one minute to the next, when you turn this on, you start capturing a build scan data for every build you run, right? And that gives you the data to then reason about where should you invest your time in optimizing projects. Or maybe you see it's a very popular project, it builds a lot, but it's already very optimized. Well, okay, let's move to something else. Right? So we'll do a very short demo here as we come towards the end. All right, so once again, we're going to use Apache Beam for our example here. And what we have is Apache Beam in Team City, and we've applied to Team City a build scan plugin. And that plugin enables uh, Gradle Enterprise on the Apache Beam project without modifying the project in any way. So we haven't changed any source files. Um, We've, all we've done is we've applied this plugin. So if we go into the build, we can see there's a build scan tab, and then 
uh, it allows us to load up a, a build scan. And what's really interesting here, however, is that that plugin did not just allow us to publish build scans. That in of itself would be useful, but applying that plugin enabled build caching on this project as well. And that's what we can see here in the build scan. And so just by uh, using a plugin in CI, we, we got uh, publishing of build scans for this project and we got build caching. So we're already getting a lot of benefit on CI without having to make any project changes whatsoever. Just last week, we did this on a project. Um, they already were using Rail Enterprise on some project, but not on all. They enabled that plugin, and they quadrupled the number of build scans on CI, really, literally over the weekend. Right. Um, so over the weekend, they enabled it. They already ran some builds, and they were four times the number of build scans than they had before. Right. And that gives them a, a sheer amount of data that they can now decide upon where should we invest our time um, to, to, to improve. And it's not just about improving, it's also finding instabilities, finding failures, and so on, all available um, without even modifying these projects. And now we can start prioritizing. I want to give you one example to come to an end here. Is we again look, looked at the spring instance, and it doesn't matter if you cannot read the exact numbers. But because we now have all this data from the build scans, we can accumulate build numbers, build time, serial task execution time, how much was avoided serially, how much could be avoided, um, and so on. Right? And we can also put that into relation into the total task execution time or goal execution time. And then we can get an idea of how, in, in how good a shape this project already is. Right? And, we, and we help them optimize these projects, so the numbers here are really good. Right? So we see 50% of all the task execution time is not done in, in spring projects across um, many months of data because they just use the cache. Right? But then there are projects, and I'll say the numbers because you probably cannot read them, that only get like 11% um, already from, are being avoided, but they have a big potential of like 63 or something percent that could come from the cache. Right? And these are candidates when you have low numbers here of what is already avoided and high numbers of what could be avoided that you want to invest those, those projects, that you get the most return for your investment. And imagine you have 10,000 projects, like I said before. Um, you, you cannot manually determine this. Um, but what you also need to take into account, it's not just where do I get the least thing and I could get the most. It's also like how much time is actually spent building these projects. And if you see a, a project is only building for 25 minutes in a, in a time of 30 days, well, you probably don't want to invest into this, even if you could get a, a, a high percentage of, of task hits. So all that has to be taken into account. But you have the data to do so, um, and you didn't even have to modify your project. And that really gets us to the end of um, what we wanted to show you. So it's basically um, uh, giving you some inspiration how you can go, go about making your projects cacheable, keeping them cacheable, and getting to the data to make informed decisions where you want to invest time into. And I would say avoiding work is work. Right? It doesn't come for free. Um, but it pays off very quickly. Right. Right. Thank you, and have a good rest of the conference.